So my task this afternoon is to try and uh, place all of what you've heard in context and to talk about what the next steps are uh, in viral eradication. And as you heard from the earlier speakers, uh, we've so far only had one example of HIV cure. I have no more uh, HIV cures to report this afternoon. Uh, and so really, um, in some ways, the sky is the limit and uh, almost anything I uh, say uh, could be uh, accurate in terms of where we should go, but also as both uh, baseball players and politicians have pointed out, all predictions are difficult, especially when they involve the future. Um, so I've already shown you my uh, 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 disclosures. So I think it's worth, first of all, uh, taking a step back and understanding why we're pursuing HIV cure and, and what the progress has, has been, and then to talk about some um, important challenges that we face. And uh, as you know, the introduction of combination antiretroviral therapy has had a profound and, and really uh, extraordinary impact on uh, AIDS-related mortality, uh, not only uh, here in the United States and in other um, uh, so-called uh, first world countries, but uh, even in uh, South Africa, uh, we, uh, as was shown a couple of years ago by Bohr and colleagues, uh, the rollout of antiretroviral therapy has reversed the decade-long slide in uh, life expectancy so that uh, there's been a dramatic turnaround uh, illustrating the life-saving nature of uh, current antiretroviral therapy. And uh, this slide uh, from uh, the uh, Amsterdam group shows that uh, in fact, if therapy is started early, uh, people with HIV infection have life expectancies that approach those of uh, uninfected uh, age-matched uh, uh, controls. So why search for a cure? Well, one of the biggest challenges is that although the treatment is highly effective, generally pretty convenient and, and reasonably safe, you have to take it uh, every day for the rest of your life. Uh, there may still be uh, side effects and cumulative toxicities from uh, these daily exposures. There's certainly the burden of lifelong adherence as well as the cost of delivering treatment uh, uh, for uh, the life of uh, all infected people. And whether this is really sustainable on a global scale uh, has uh, been questioned, especially with the flat funding of PEPFAR uh, in recent years and the continued uh, global economic crisis. There are also, as you heard from, uh, um, uh, from Javier and others, uh, adverse effects of HIV persistence, including inappropriate immune activation, which may then lead to end organ uh, damage, uh, the potential for transmission if an infected person goes off therapy and experiences viral rebound, uh, and when you speak with uh, uh, people uh, living with HIV infection, it's clear that the ongoing stigma of HIV infection is a strong motivator in the, uh, on their end to search for a cure and to participate in studies uh, aimed at HIV cure. But also, be, uh, and as you heard, uh, from the impressive data presented uh, by the previous four speakers, there's now a, a real opportunity to try and uh, attack the issue of uh, HIV eradication because we have a much better understanding of the mechanisms of HIV persistence. There have been uh, a number of novel targets that have been identified that allow for uh, the development of drugs uh, uh, designed to inhibit those targets. And these novel approaches have then led to testable hypotheses that can be explored both in animal models, be they uh, uh, non-human primates or the uh, humanized mouse, and eventually uh, in human clinical trials. One of the biggest challenges we face in uh, addressing uh, this field, though, is just what do we mean by cure? <clears throat> and if you get uh, four or five uh, uh, investigators in a room, uh, you will have uh, five or six opinions about uh, what it means to cure HIV. There's the ultimate of HIV eradication, or sometimes called sterilizing cure, meaning elimination of all HIV uh, from all blood and tissue uh, reservoirs, something that is essentially uh, unprovable in any living uh, organism uh, or human. There's functional cure, which is uh, sometimes defined as having no detectable virus in the blood or tissues in the absence of antiretroviral therapy, but you can't uh, really disprove persistence at inaccessible sites. And we can argue whether uh, Timothy Ray Brown is truly cured or has been functionally cured and is undergoing a very long-term uh, uh, treatment-free remission. And then there's uh, durable uh, treatment-free remission, which is somewhere 
um, you know, in uh, short of a true uh, functional cure, where there may not be detectable plasma viremia, there may not be any transmissible uh, virus uh, in the absence of uh, antiretroviral therapy, but there might still be some detectable virus. And this is uh, particularly an issue because we know so much of the proviral DNA is defective. Uh, would it be important if we failed to er eliminate all of the defective uh, uh, proviral, uh, proviral sequences so long as we had eliminated the important ones and you could take someone off therapy and virus, uh, replicating virus didn't come back for uh, a long period of time. So um, we are approximately uh, here in the search for uh, a cure. We don't really quite know uh, where we are except that we are at the, the very uh, beginning. Um, as you've heard, there are a number of approaches that can be taken. Uh, these include cell-based therapies, and uh, Paula Cannon just gave a, a, a very nice summary of uh, the use of gene editing. Uh, there is the use of uh, uh, various agents to stimulate HIV production from uh, the latent uh, reservoir, whether those are truly resting cells or not, uh, at least cells that are not actively making HIV in the um, most uh, uh, progress has been made thus far using uh, inhibitors of uh, histone deacetylase or uh, in, uh, the use of a TLR7 agonist. Uh, and then a variety of immune-based interventions are, uh, have either been piloted or are being considered, uh, as uh, Dan Baruch summarized, including the use of immune checkpoint blockers, uh, therapeutic vaccines, and, and broadly neutralizing uh, antibodies. So we've at least defined that there is a tunnel. We know that there is some route to, to pursue, uh, and um, with the uh, Berlin patient and evidence that in, in at least one person, HIV has apparently been uh, eliminated or there is sustained remission or functional cure, we can even say not only is there a tunnel, the tunnel has lights. Uh, there is some path that uh, we, can, uh, we can begin to uh, uh, tread down uh, in pursuit of, uh, of a cure. And we've had, uh, beyond uh, uh, Timothy Ray Brown, some partial successes. We know, uh, and uh, Javier summarized uh, these data, that with uh, each of the um, HDAC inhibitors that have been used, uh, that you can at least get uh, induction or, or uh, uh, stimulation of uh, the transcription of uh, RNA that includes uh, uh, HIV RNA, and in the case of the panabinostat and romadepsin studies, uh, some preliminary evidence that in at least uh, some patients treated with uh, those agents, there appears to be a release of uh, virus particles, so more than just transcriptional upregulation, but actually uh, uh, viral uh, RNA translation, packaging, and, and, uh, and release. But it's also clear that latency reversal by itself is certainly not sufficient to affect HIV cure. None of those studies showed any uh, significant reduction in the uh, level of reservoir, no matter how you chose to measure it, uh, although maybe a small number of patients in, in a couple of the studies had some reduction, but on, in aggregate there was really no meaningful reduction. And whether um, uh, in all of the patients these uh, latency reversing agents are actually increasing expression in, uh, or, uh, and uh, from what, what we haven't yet uh, sorted out is whether uh, the uh, increased transcription that's being observed is in cells that were already making uh, uh, HIV RNA or whether uh, there were new cells recruited to produce uh, RNA. And we would have to get expression in all cells uh, in order to be able to uh, er eradicate them. Uh, we need to understand what agents are synergistic uh, with these uh, uh, latency reversing uh, drugs. And the biggest challenge we face is how to choose among the myriad potential combinations in order to test them in clinical trials in some rational uh, combination. So there's some light at the end of the tunnel, uh, but uh, there's still hazards along the way, and these are perhaps best illustrated by our own experience here with the so-called Boston patients, uh, uh, two patients who received uh, um, allogeneic stem cell transplantation uh, of wild-type cells, but uh, maintained antiretroviral therapy uh, throughout the transplant process, and then uh, years uh, after their transplant uh, had uh, no longer any detectable uh, HIV uh, proviral DNA or uh, HIV RNA, and, and as uh, uh, Dan Baruch made uh, 
the point in his presentation, uh, just because you can't find things in the peripheral blood doesn't mean they don't uh, persist elsewhere. And uh, sure enough, after uh, interrupting therapy uh, in these patients, uh, uh, after a variable period of time, in the case of patient B, after more than 200 days, eventually a virus came uh, roaring back and then was uh, controlled by reinitiation of therapy. So we have to be careful that when we're looking at a light at the end of the tunnel, that we know that it's actually light and not an onrushing train uh, coming right at us. And I show this merely to make the point that these experiments that we're beginning to do in people have real hazards. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the immune checkpoint blockers have uh, significant side effects, uh, treatment interruption can have side effects, and so we have to go about this uh, cautiously and, uh, and deliberately. So I'd like to spend the rest of my time talking about the need for uh, surrogate markers and correlates of cure in order to help guide our, uh, our approaches, uh, because, uh, as I think, uh, uh, all of the talks made clear, uh, we're really still stymied in trying to understand just how to best measure the reservoir and what parameters to follow as evidence that we are having some effect on the reservoir in order to know uh, which combinations are going to be most promising, uh, when uh, treatment interruptions are, uh, are appropriate, and whether the effects we observe in treatment interruption are in fact due to a, a reduction in the reservoir or whether there is an alternative mechanistic explanation at, uh, at work. So why do we need uh, surrogates? Uh, so as I've said, there are numerous uh, interventions being uh, considered. Uh, I think there's a general consensus in the field that a test of cure is ultimately going to require uh, analytic treatment interruption or monitored uh, treatment pause, if you prefer. And prioritizing these interventions and combinations uh, might be simplified by the availability of a validated surrogate uh, uh, marker. Measuring the relative effects of candidate interventions on a surrogate could also guide improvements in the approaches, improved uh, schedules of vaccination or improved dosages for uh, 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 various therapeutic uh, uh, modalities. So what is a surrogate marker? A surrogate is a, a clinical or laboratory parameter uh, that's measured in place of a clinical endpoint. And surrogate markers can be used to simplify the conduct of clinical trials leading to the registration of a new product or device or adopting a new uh, treatment uh, paradigm. And they can guide dose selection and product enhancements. They can reduce the cost and complexity of trials. They replace the need for clinical endpoint studies if you have a truly validated surrogate, and therefore they can reduce the risk to participants. For example, when we introduced uh, virus load testing into uh, uh, the development of antiretroviral drugs, we no longer had to enroll thousands of patients and wait to see uh, which treatment led to fewer deaths. We could show that uh, uh, which regimens most rapidly and uh, effectively reduced uh, virus replication to zero. So, Surrogate markers have a number of important properties. It, it, this, is, uh, this field has been around uh, for a while, and I, I'd actually forgotten that Peter Gilbert, who's now the lead statistician for the HIV vaccine uh, network, and I had written an article on <laughs> surrogate markers in their use in antiretroviral therapy when we were still struggling to validate virus load. And uh, to find a, a marker endpoint as uh, being a good surrogate for a clinical endpoint, if the observed treatment effects on the marker reliably predict treatment effects on the clinical endpoint. And then um, uh, uh, Prentiss, in uh, his uh, classic uh, paper in uh, statistics and medicine from uh, nearly 30 years ago now, uh, uh, when surrogate markers were first being uh, uh, rigorously studied, uh, said that uh, the biological marker must be correlated with the clinical outcome and must fully capture the effect of treatment on the clinical endpoint. And this, this second point is really key. And then as Tom Fleming and uh, Dave Demetz, uh, who are leading uh, uh, figures in the world of biostatistics and in clinical trials, pointed out in uh, also another classic article 20 years ago, uh, ideally the marker uh, should lie on the causal pathway uh, to the clinical outcome of interest. So you have a, a disease process, there's some intervention, it has an effect on the surrogate endpoint, and you hope that the endpoint it is altering is in fact responsible for the for the true clinical outcome. And I'll come back to uh, some examples of why this may not always be the case and what the consequences uh, uh, can be. 
So other desirable properties of a surrogate are that they, there should be a, a pharmacodynamic relationship between the intervention and its effect on the marker. The more uh, drug or the more intervention you, you provide, the bigger the effect on the marker. Uh, the marker should be simple to measure. If it takes uh, uh, tens of thousands of dollars and liters of blood, that's not going to be a useful surrogate marker, even if it's an accurate marker. It should be inexpensive and reproducible with, uh, with low variance so that uh, you can use, uh, have efficient design of trials with relatively small uh, uh, sample sizes and also so that uh, uh, changes within an individual uh, can be uh, measured and found to be meaningful. An important distinction that needs to be made is that prognostic markers are not necessarily surrogate markers. And as Michael Hughes, the director of the ACTG uh, Stat Center, has said, a prognostic, uh, uh, not all prognostic markers are surrogate markers. Uh, uh, it does not suffice that a marker is a good prognostic indicator. It's important to show that differences between uh, two treatments or a treatment and a placebo uh, actually uh, uh, predict the differences in, in their outcome. So. Um, just to uh, back up, since I uh, uh, prematurely quoted Michael, um, uh, the prognostic marker is something that you measure at a particular time and predicts the likelihood of some future event. Um, uh, and then uh, examples of a number of markers we use commonly in uh, HIV uh, work that are not clearly surrogates, but are, are uh, prognostic markers include inflammatory markers like IL-6 and D-dimer, uh, cellular activation markers, or thinking about other disease entities, complement levels in uh, lupus, uh, for example, is a prognostic marker, but not a very useful surrogate marker. So why correlates are not necessarily surrogates is, is illustrated in uh, uh, this, the rest of that figure from uh, Fleming and Demetz. So you can imagine that there's an intervention that uh, has an effect on a surrogate endpoint, but that surrogate endpoint has absolutely nothing to do with the clinical outcome, even though it might uh, be a correlate of cl the clinical outcome. Uh, you could have an intervention that affects the surrogate, but it's only one of several paths that lead to the outcome, and there are other processes at work uh, that the uh, intervention doesn't affect that still allow for uh, the disease to progress. Uh, worse still, there could be an in intervention that's completely effective but isn't captured at all by your surrogate endpoint, and so you're measuring the wrong thing. Uh, or more commonly, you have an intervention that has uh, multiple effects, some of which affect the surrogate endpoint, uh, others that are uncaptured by the surrogate, and you could think of toxicity uh, of, from uh, drug treatment as being an example of a, an effect of an intervention not captured by your surrogate. So you give didanazine, you reduce virus load, uh, patients get a little bit better, but they get neuropathy and pancreatitis, and the fact that their virus load goes down doesn't at all predict what's going to happen in terms of the toxicities. So let me give you uh, two quick examples of how correlates failed to be uh, surrogates. Um, the first comes uh, from another viral disease in the search for an Ebola virus vaccine uh, and this work from uh, uh, Sullivan uh, et al. that uh, was published uh, uh, several years ago. Um, and uh, what you, uh, they had developed a, uh, a vaccine that uh, um, uh, produced uh, high titers of, uh, uh, of Ebola antibody, and they found uh, that uh, as a correlate uh, that antibody titers above uh, a certain level, above 3,000 uh, units, led to 100% survival, and above 2,000 units led to 85% survival. So you might reasonably think that uh, the antibody here was protective. Uh, but um, in moving forward with this vaccine, they were asked by the uh, agent, FDA to to confirm that it was the antibodies that were protective. And so they did two very clever experiments that had a really surprising result. In the first uh, experiment, what they did was to take vaccinated animals, to, to harvest uh, uh, immunoglobulin from vaccinated animals. And they then um, uh, had uh, three groups of animals. Uh, one uh, control group that received no treatment was exposed to Ebola and they all died. The second group uh, uh, received the uh, uh, recombinant adenovirus vaccine, and they all survived. And then this third group received transfused or passive immunity with the uh, Ebola antibody, which was shown to be a correlate of protection, but they died almost as rapidly as the controls did, so, suggesting that it wasn't actually protective. And then they did a reciprocal experiment where they took um, 
animals uh, and either uh, vaccinated them uh, and challenged them, gave them no other treatment, and they survived. Uh, they had the controls who died. Or they vaccinated the animals and then they treated them with an anti-CD8 antibody that depleted their cytotoxic T cells and those animals died, providing strong uh, evidence that it was actually cellular immunity, not humoral immunity, that, that was protective. So the antibody was a good correlate, but not the mechanism of protection, measuring the wrong thing in this case. A famous example from uh, the world of HIV medicine is the IL-2 story, and here, this is a good example of why a, uh, a marker that is validated as a surrogate in one context may fail to serve as a surrogate in, an, in another context. And so in the case of IL-2, we knew that uh, CD4 was a valid surrogate for antiretroviral therapy. If you increase CD4 cells with antiviral therapy, you would delay disease progression, and that had been the basis for approval of antiretroviral drugs. It was shown by Joe Kovach and the group at NIAID that if you gave interleukin-2, you could similarly increase uh, CD4s even more dramatically than was the case with antiretroviral therapy available uh, at the time. So it was thought, okay, if we can increase CD4 cells, maybe IL-2 therapy will be uh, clinically useful. But of course, the Esprit and Silcat studies both showed that uh, giving IL-2, although it led to an increase in CD4 cells, uh, failed to delay disease progression or uh, the need to initiate antiretroviral therapy. And the clear distinction here is that the mechanism by which IL-2 was increasing uh, CD4 counts had nothing to do with the reason that CD4 cells increased when you stop virus replication. So uh, different mechanisms required revalidation of surrogacy, uh, and here the uh, CD4s were clearly not a surrogate uh, of an effect, and IL-2 uh, failed in these trials. So you've heard uh, from all of the previous speakers about a variety of different approaches that might be taken uh, for monitoring the reservoir and its effect uh, and the effects of interventions. And it's fair to say at the present time, uh, we really have no clue uh, which of these might be uh, best suited to the task. Um, uh, Brigitte Autan showed some data from uh, 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 the uh, 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 one of the, the studies uh, uh, done in, uh, in France, uh, uh, John Lee in, uh, in our group had uh, very similar data showing that uh, uh, the levels of uh, cell-associated RNA and the levels of cell-associated DNA uh, uh, predict a set point after a treatment interruption uh, and also as uh, uh, Javier showed uh, from uh, John's paper, uh, cell-associated RNA also is uh, correlated with a time to rebound. Uh, in a treatment interruption. But whether that uh, is really the target that we want to uh, be monitoring, whether this is a true surrogate, and whether if we delay, uh, if we reduce cell-associated RNA, we will necessarily find an uh, increased time to a rebound is uh, still something that needs to be uh, proven. And um, uh, the, uh, borrowing a slide from my um, uh, co-chair here uh, in her work with, uh, uh, with uh, Bob Silicano, one of the biggest challenges we face is that in any given individual, uh, not only is, our, is the size of the reservoir uh, dramatically different, but the relative proportions of uh, replication uh, competent, uh, of uh, inducible viruses uh, that can be recovered through uh, culture, uh, the uh, viruses that are present, proviruses that are present and should be replication competent but don't reactivate, and then the larger pool of proviruses that are uh, de defective uh, vary from patient to patient, and so uh, there's, uh, given that huge interpatient variation, uh, these uh, measures remain uh, incredibly difficult to, uh, uh, to adopt into clinical trials. So uh, the challenges we face are that, first and foremost, absent an effective intervention, validation of a surrogate is really not uh, possible, and we have the same struggles now in the cure field that the vaccine field has been uh, dealing with for uh, uh, the last uh, uh, 20 or more years. Uh, potent effects on markers in the peripheral blood may not at all reflect changes in tissue reservoirs, and the lessons we learned uh, in the Boston patients and, and what uh, uh, Dan Bruch showed in the, uh, in the macaque model are that complete absence in the peripheral blood is no guarantee uh, that you've had any meaningful effect on the reservoir in the tissues where virus may persist. Changes in any one marker may explain only 
part of the clinical benefit of an intervention, and we've certainly seen that in uh, antiretroviral therapeutics where virus load and CD4 count are useful surrogates but not complete surrogates. And then as I uh, told the story with uh, the uh, IL-2 and CD4, uh, surrogate uh, markers may be specific to the mechanism of a particular intervention. So let me end there and uh, acknowledge uh, first uh, uh, John Lee and Tim Henrich who uh, did the work uh, that I, I showed here and a larger number of, uh, of collaborators and particularly my colleagues at uh, the Harvard School of Public Health who've uh, helped uh, over the years in uh, thinking about surrogate markers and, uh, and the, the best way to apply them in clinical trials. So thanks very much. <laughs>